Okay, so uh, many of us have heard of uh, Sigmund Freud, but not many of Arthur Schnitzler. And Freud is known for his work um, in the cognitive field, and Arthur Schnitzler actually has a lot of work relevant to him, but is not nearly as well known. Um, so I'm going to start telling you all about him. So Sigmund Freud uh, was born Sigismund Schlomo Freud. Um, he was born in Freiburg, which was then the Austrian Empire, um, but it later became the Czech Republic. So you can see it's, that's the region where it was, um, the city of Freiburg. Uh, and then this is kind of like Austria, and I'll show you a better map. Um, this is current Europe, and so Freiburg was, was, is like right about here, or it was. Now it's part of the Czech Republic. Um, but so he's technically Austrian. Oh, when he was four, he moved over to Vienna with his family. And then he died in exile in London, England, um, because he was born to a Jewish family, and uh, in 1939, the persecutions had already kind of begun, so he fled to, to London. Um, so like I said, he was born into a Jewish family, um, and he pursued a career in uh, the medical field. He went to the University of Vienna, which is a pretty well-reputed school for, um, for medical studies. And um, he was the first of eight kids, and he was treated the best because he was the first. That's how it worked back then. Um, and so he started to pursue um, studies into hysteria, uh, which at the time was... So hysteria, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's your symptoms are just kind of like the, all kinds of symptoms. It's not really like the same thing. Um, in each case, uh, you can, it's basically just women being women is how they would call it. And so if you're, if you're having, anyway, and so, it, so the root, the word hyster his, is Greek and it means the womb. And so they believed that hysteria was caused by a shift in the position of the womb. And so therefore it only affected women. Men, men couldn't get it physiologically. Um, so who's focusing on that? And a major thing to note in the medical field at this time was there was no notion of the subconscious or the unconscious. Um, medical symptoms, they, were, they searched for mental conditions for reasons uh, like physically on the body. Like they would literally cut you open and look for lesions in your brain or other places and they would say like, oh, you've got a wart on your foot. That's, you know, why you're depressed. Um, <laughs> well, they didn't have the pet. Anyway, uh, so you might know the, the kind of classic visual of a, a couch and then a patient like laying on it and talking to the um, talking to the psychologist or the therapist and so Freud kind of uh, he established this this idea and he would he would sit and sit behind it so in this chair here so that the patient couldn't see him and so that has to do with what he contributed to the field his ideas of transference and free association transference is the idea that you've got an issue with with like one person from your past and you kind of transfer, it's like projections, so you transfer it onto somebody else. And so by, by being out of their visual field, he kind of tried to avoid that effect um, in his patients. And then free association, association is when he just kind of allowed his patients to talk and he would just say, okay, go. And they would go from subject to subject and make their own connection. Um, and then they were able to really kind of uncover their, the reasons for their um, mental issues. They had all like, you know, different kind of um, and so he, he established these things. These are totally new in the cognitive field. Um, he also contributed uh, other ideas, which we're going to talk about. Um, we move on to the concept. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, I got out of order. So first off, so he came up with three elements of personality, id, ego, and superego. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it, so I'll just go over it really quickly. So first, you're, you're born with your id, um, which is basically your instinct drives, your animalistic um, your drives to really um, realize gratification of your basic needs, and so food, um, shelter, love, sex, that kind of thing. And it's totally unconscious. You're not in control of that. You're not aware of it. And then second, second developed is your ego, which is, um, well, we'll jump to the superego. So the superego is the last to develop. It is the moral regulator. It really says, um, just brings morals into the idea that uh, you can't steal that because it's morally wrong and, and you'll feel bad. Um, and then your ego kind of balances between your, your instinctual drives and then your moral ideas, your morals, um, to kind of balance you out. So, you're, so all together they make up your personality. Um, and then the pre-conscious, the idea of the pre-conscious versus conscious and unconscious. Pre-conscious is what we can access. So we can access these memories and we can access these feelings and they're, they're within our, our reach of our mind. The unconscious is gone. We've, we've repressed it by that point. Um, so all this part of our personality is not really at our disposal. Um, and then I've got a quick little clip I want to show you guys to demonstrate the ego, the id, and superego. So let's see if we can identify each of these elements. <laughs>
don't know that's from uh, the Hershey Church in New York who went to Eastern School. Okay, so um, who was the little devil guy? The id, yeah, it's the id. I don't know why he. Anyway, um, and who was the angel? The super ego. The super ego, yeah. And so the ego is trying to balance these ideas, um, these two extremes. And Freud introduced this idea. Um, so I'm going to quickly run through these. So if you haven't heard of Freud's work with the libido and um, his psychosexual stages of development, I'm going to go through them real, really quickly. The libido, a lot of people associate that with pure sexual drives. Actually, the way he originally defined it was um, libido is just your search for gratification. So that could be any, any physical gratification, so like eating or... Um, you know, like laughing, well, not laughing, anyway, so your basic physical needs, but sex is the strongest, is what he posited, is that um, the greatest gratification is through sex. Um, so with this, so as you're growing and you're developing your id, well, you're born with your id, and then you have your ego and, and superego, um, you're kind of learning how to, how to coordinate with the world and with yourself. So the first stage, when you're, between when you're born and about 18 months, you're going through the oral stage, um, and so basically, he, he says that what, the way your brain is developing, you're also interacting with the world in a physical sense, and also na naturally the way he says is sexual, because that's the greatest gratification. So your first stage is your oral stage, because all you can really use to think about things is your mouth, so you're a baby, and you're putting everything in your mouth. Um, and the, the main, uh, what did I call it? Um, the key, the key experience is weaning from breastfeeding. So depending on how your mother weans you from breastfeeding, whether it's forcefully or like casually or gradually, sorry, um, depends on kind of if you get fixated in the stage. And fixation in the stage, I crossed it out because this chart has a little weird, um, but fixation results, well, like I said, from too much or too little breastfeeding. If you become morally aggressive through fixation, then um, you can exhibit certain signs and symptoms. And then if you become uh, orally passive, then you can exhibit other signs and symptoms. There's not as much cognitive affection here. Um, it's mostly just physical if you get fixated in this stage. Next stage is the anal stage. It's between 18 months and three years. It's kind of when you start learning about elimination and getting rid of your, your stuff and figuring out what to do with it and how you deal with it. Um, and so you can become, this is, so it, depending on how your parents uh, toilet train you. So if you kind of take to it easily or if they're really strict with it or, you know, if you, um, don't like to do that, just, you know, however you're developing, you can either become anally retentive or anally expulsive. And so that's where we get the phrase, like, oh my gosh, I'm so anal about my towels. Like, that means you're, you, well, it means anally retentive. Technically, anally can go both ways. Or anal, anyway. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, so you can become, if your parents are really strict with your toilet training and you don't make that choice, um, then you become obsessively just organized, you just, like something else is kind of controlling your desire for organization says Freud. Uh, and then anal expulsion is kind of the opposite. You're just, your gratification comes through being, you know, not taking care of your stuff and, and that kind of thing. Like coprophilia? Coprophilia, we can talk about it if you'd like to. <laughs> does anybody have an idea what coprophilia is? Fixation on yeah, it's like an obsession with it. It's like an erotic stimulation through feces, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's been said that Hitler uh, expressed coprophilia. So. <laughs> the next stage is the phallic stage. We start discovering our genitals, but it's mostly um, directed towards the self and towards the family because we're not really sexually developed yet in terms of other people. So it's mostly internally focused, and this is where he developed the idea of the Oedipus complex, and um, Carl Jung later uh, talked about the electric complex. The Oedipus complex is where boys are enamored with their mothers and they see their father as competition for their mother's love and so they both try to undermine their father to get to the mother and then they're both fearing their father they actually there's a it's very common to fear castration they fear that their fathers are gonna um effeminate them demasculate them and take their mothers forever and yeah and this is just part of development and um and, and in females um it's the it's this it's kind of the opposite sort of the with the electric complex it's more of a desire to like well, this is where he, he 
postulated the idea of penis envy that we we want to be our fathers. We are so you know we need their power pieces, um, and we get really mad at our mothers. The way you kind of uh, are supposed to grow through this stage is developing your own identification with your same sex parents. So the fathers would start identifying with their father and taking on traits of his so that instead of being an enemy, they're more of on the same team and then they're both there with their mothers. Um, and as they grow, they also kind of realize they're not in love with their parents. Um, and then the same with the other side. The female starts taking on the characteristics of the mother and um, doesn't want a penis anymore. <laughs> Latency, we're kind of given a break. We don't really have anything too major going on. We're kind of just thinking about all we've been through for the past six years. And it lasts till about puberty. Um, the main thing is just to really socially develop. We start seeking gratification instead of in these other areas. Um, we start seeking gratification through other people. So we start to socialize and develop bonds with other people. Um, and you can just, uh, just basic social um, hang-ups and stuff can result from from fixation in this stage, so sexual unfulfillment is what this chart says, but you can have all kinds of, um, you know, hang-ups from that. And then the final stage is the genital stage. It, it starts with puberty, and then it goes on forever. So hi, everybody. We're all in the same stage. Um, so this is where we go back to our genitals, and, and but that we involve them with other people. It's no longer mas masturbatory. It's more involved with the public and like other people are. And so um, fixation in this stage occurs from you know failure to develop, failure to establish social relationships, similar with the phallic stage. Um, but at this time, Freud also suggests that we can start fixing what went wrong with us in these other stages and kind of correcting the directions that we might not be going in the right way. So this is one of Freud's most major contributions. Now I'm going to talk about Arthur Schnitzer. What's really interesting at this time was Freud was not really that well known. Um, yeah, he's so, so pensive. Um, <laughs> Freud was not really well known. Arthur Schnitzer was much more popular than Freud, um, but he was a writer. He was, so he was born in Vienna. Um, that time was the Austrian Empire, and he died in Vienna. He lived there his whole life. Um, so also, German-speaking Austrian. Um, there's Vienna. You see there's Austria as well. Um, and he... Stage. Yeah, so he was a novelist, short story author, and a playwright, and he did a lot of things um, that Freud, Freud really agreed with. He, ha he had a, kind of a lot of the same concepts, basically, um, and I'll show you some examples. So some of his major contribution, contributions, Ra uh, Reigen was a play of his. It's a ten-act play, and each act has, or ten-scene play, sorry, um, each scene has a couple, and they, they have a pre- and post-coitus discussion. And, and then it goes on to the next scene. And what's interesting is one of the partners from the previous scene finds a new partner in the next scene. Reigen means round dance. So it's basically a couple has sex. The guy goes to the next scene and has sex with a different lady. The lady moves on in, in, in different scenes. It's basically talking about, and these are people from all socioeconomic statuses, talking about how people can connect on a sexual level um, with other people. And it was really controversial. Uh, it played for two days, and then the police came and shut it down, and <laughs> there was an obscenity trial. It was actually probably largely anti-Semitic instead of because of the content, but he's still labeled a pornographer after that. Um, it was adapted into a French film, and so that's how it's best known. I still have never heard of La Ronde, but um, it means the same thing, the round, I don't know, I don't speak French. Um, but yeah, and then uh, he also wrote uh, Coin and Elsa, um, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. It's a book that we read in the German literature class, and then Tom Mabella which you might have seen Stanley Kubrick's film Eyes Wide Shut. Um, that's an uh, interpretation of Tom Novello, which means dream story. Um, Point on Elsa just means Miss Elsa or the girl Elsa. He was a member of the avant-garde group of writers in Vienna, Austria, which means he's trying to branch out from um, the norm of writing. So how does he relate to Freud? He went to the same university as Freud and graduated about four years later, and he studied the exact same program, uh, got the same degree, and studied under the same people. He actually was a doctor for a little bit. Um, his father was a laryngologist, laryngolo mouth doctor. And, <laughs> and, um, and so his father really wanted him to fall in his footsteps and be a doctor as well. Uh, but Sch and Schitzer was okay with it. You know, he was a doctor up until the point where his father died. But until his father died, he kind of lived a sort of double life. He, um, he was a doctor and doing all the good things was a good doctor too. Um, but he also wrote things, uh, and he was a playboy. He started visiting prostitutes when he was about 16, I believe, 
And he, he kept track of every orgasm he had um, in a little diary that he had for years. Um, I haven't been able to find it, but if somebody does, let me know. <laughs> Not that I'm interested. Uh, so, yeah, so um, the interesting thing is, so Freud and Schnitzer both studied the same thing, and, uh, which is that the, the you know, mental, mental problems are physical in, in, in source. But Freud started uh, researching and like with his studies in hysteria and he was actually a doctor and he practiced and then he developed um, you know, different sessions and, and that type of thing uh, with um, you know, the couch. <laughs> and then, but Schnitzer didn't do that. He didn't really work with people. When he was a doctor, he was doing basic consultation. And then he started writing and he basically just wrote out and, um, and basically started writing about the same ideas as Freud, as Freud did. They actually wrote two stories that were super similar. So that, that Foyla and Elsa um, that I was talking about, it's about this girl. Sorry you guys haven't read it, but it's about this girl who um, basically, she's about 19 and she lives away from her family and her family writes to her. It's in the early 1900s, I think. No, 1800s, sorry. Her family writes to her because her father's severely in debt and they want her to go to a family friend and ask him for money, which is, they're playing on her morals. They, um, she says that she knows what they want her to, what they want her to do. Um, and basically, throughout the story, it's about a 50-page story. It's entirely internal monologue, and she's kind of losing her mind over this over this dilemma. And then by the end, um, it ends really dramatically. She ends up um, the author or the the readers led to believe that she commits suicide. And the story that Floyd wrote is actually very very similar, but they wrote it at different times, and they they didn't really communicate until after they both written these stories. They started writing letters to each other. Um, Remember, they lived in the same city. They met about four times in their life, and they were super similar in work, but they exchanged letters um, that are kind of somewhat well-documented. So um, Schnitzler wrote to Freud to say happy birthday, and then wrote, by the way, I really like your work. You've inspired me a lot. And then Freud writes back and goes, no way, you've inspired me. I like your work. I know. And then, but they, so they wrote in 1906, and then they wrote again in 1912, reminding each other how much they like each other. And then in 1922, Freud, said, Freud writes and says, I don't know why I've never tried to meet you. Finally, they meet up a couple times and they talk about things, but they both kind of express how weird it is that they like each other or that they're so similar. And Freud even says, I don't know if I have a quote. No, he says he, he doesn't understand how Schnitzer, or he thinks it's amazing how Schnitzer was able to come to the same conclusions that Freud did um, just by writing without the study um, and that with Freud doing so many studies. Um, and then Freud says, ich meine, ich habe sie gemeiden aus einer Art von Doppelgängerschweif, which means I think I avoided you uh, from a type of, if you know the word doppelgänger, and then scheu means like shy. So he's shying away from meeting his, his um, doppelganger, the, his similarity, his twin, yeah, you could say. Um, a person who's, in conf who's confronted with his double gets confused about his own ego. So Freud was kind of afraid of who he was and what it meant that he had someone that basically he thought was very, very similar to him. Um, which you can also go into all kinds of theories about that with what that means about what, what Freud believes about um, cognitive cognition and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'll end it here. I know I've gone a little bit long, but uh, I hope you guys learned something. And uh, there's some more sources if you're interested. Yeah. Thank you.